Hello. Hello. This is Ergo. I'm Kiss. I am Damon. And what we do here is reshape the culture of our city and beyond with a more equitable and creative. We are so excited to come back with another edition of the Sawyer Seminar, Radical Care, Real Alternatives, brought to you by UIC Social Justice Initiative. This fifth episode of our Sawyer Seminar series features a conversation between UIC professors Rachel Weber and Philip Ashton. The duo have worked extensively studying the ways that Chicago and other cities over the last 20 years have commodified their public infrastructure, sold it off, and the ways that private corporations in the finance industry both profit from and control what our cities can look like, leaving us all both at their will and incredibly vulnerable if their high-risk financial maneuvers don't pay off. This is definitely on the wonkier end of our episodes, but I think this is one of those issues that we all see but don't quite have the language to understand. So I'm so glad that Rachel and Phil took the time to really go in-depth about how this privatization works and what it could take to move control of our public back into the hands of the public. As always, you can hear all of the Sawyer Seminar episodes on Ergo's podcast feed. Just search AIRGO wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure that you subscribe, comment, and leave us a review. We always forget to ask you to do that, but we we love it, if we're being perfectly honest. We got one more Sawyer Seminar episode coming for you next month, but for now, we hope you enjoy this next edition of the Sawyer Seminar. Here we go. School of more stage like I'm doing a seminar. I'm doing a seminar. I'm doing a seminar. Doors closing. That's the rumble of the L, the subway in Chicago. It's kind of the soundtrack to the city. It's a common sound that we hear when we walk around the city, which is something that Phil and I like to do. And if you're walking near the subway tracks on the west side of Chicago, you'll see it'll be the green line. And when you see trains, you may be thinking about public transit or you know, whether or not the trains are running on time, whether or not you're going to be able to take it to get to your job or to see your friends or what the train costs to ride. When Phil and I see the green line, we see cash flows, right? Every time we ride the L or park our cars or pay a toll or pay our property taxes, we're paying for the use of urban infrastructures. But in many cases, we're actually paying a private investor, not the city or a municipal government, for this service. Let's take a look at an example. The Green Line is actually uh, an excellent case. It's one of the iconic pieces of infrastructure of the rail line that serves the west side and the south side of the city. Back in 1998, the city of Chicago pretty quietly set up a financial arrangement known as a lease leaseback where it transferred the rail lines to a private investor in return for an upfront payment of $339 million. The agency would then pay investors an annual lease for the right to use the lines throughout the 44-year term of the deal. The upside for the city was that it got a large cash payment to help it plug some budget holes that were growing at the time when the system was reeling from declining ridership, deferred maintenance. The downside was that 10 years later, during the 2008 financial crisis, the payments owed to the investors were secured by the insurance giant AIG. When that firm collapsed as a part of the financial crisis, the Green Line investors declared that CTA was in default. It threatened to shut down the service and make the agency pay a $76 million penalty. CTA had to hustle to find a new insurer. But at the peak of the drama, the city was 30 days away from losing service to the west and south sides of the city. So private investors were the ones who got to answer the question of whether trains would run on time. Phil, this kind of privatization isn't necessarily new, is it, right? We've been contracting out for public services for decades, right? Governments contract out to security services or they contract with a 
private firm to provide, you know, janitorial services to clean up public office buildings. Uh, what's so new about or different about these kinds of infrastructure privatizations? What we describe with the greed line is different than just contracting out. So yes, a private firm becomes responsible for delivering the services and the upkeep and the maintenance. But this trend to selling city assets involves private firms buying the rights to collect revenues that cities previously collected. So it's a much larger question around how city budgets are arranged. And it touches a lot of what we think of as infrastructure, roads, bridges, water systems, airports, and increasingly a lot of the facilities that are tied into our daily lives, libraries, police stations, schools. There are also some real differences between these kinds of financial arrangements that we saw with the Green Line and regular privatization. So in in many ways, Chicago was an innovator uh, in this area. In 2004, uh, the city solicited bids to lease out the Chicago Skyway. So only six years after the Green Line deal, I put up this seven-mile toll road at the southern end of the city, connecting the city to northwest Indiana. And that deal was something of a surprise. The bridge itself, the road, had been in financial difficulty for decades. The revenues had only really stabilized and started to increase in the 1990s. The city at the time estimated that maybe it would earn about $900 million from the sale and it would use that to retire some debt. But it was shocked when the winning bid came in at $1.82 billion. And that bid came from a consortium led by the Australian investment bank Macquarie and the Spanish engineering firm Sintra. That long-term lease and the success of selling a recycled old toll road, that kicked off a much larger wave of infrastructure privatization that included the city's underground parking garages, uh, the street parking meters in 2008, and at least two attempts to privatize the Midway Airport. Right. Attempts that failed, I think, because of the global financial crisis, but probably would have gone through if that had not occurred. You know, Chicago's seems like an exception, but also, you know, in in some ways not that different from what cities, not just in the United States, but around the world have been doing for a while. Right. They've moved from a reliance on private contractors providing standardized services like janitorial services to more systematically transferring existing city infrastructures to private investors. Um, So in addition to these Chicago deals that went down in the early 2000s, we have leases for the Northwest Parkway outside of Denver, the Indiana Toll Road, the Dulles Greenway outside of Washington, D.C. These were all sold to private investors. And the current pipeline is so large, it's really hard to know, know definitively what it contains. I know that There was talk of privatizing the border crossing, the bridge between Detroit and Windsor, Ontario, the port of Portland and Oregon. It just seems like every month we're seeing more more deals be proposed, you know, and some of them actually going forward. And these are really deals that transform the very nature of what we mean by urban infrastructure, moving from a, a kind of public good to looking at infrastructure as an asset that generates cash flows that are potentially capturable by investors. These deals raise a lot of questions, questions that we've attempted to answer in our research and questions that public administrators and policymakers and community organizations are struggling with. You know, how should cities be managed? How should we think about urban futures? You know, who are you paying every time you pay a toll or a fare? Uh, From a democratic perspective, who can I complain to if I'm not happy with the quality of the these ostensibly public services or infrastructure? You know, what if there is an emergency like a pandemic, for example? You know, we expect the public sector and, and public things to help us during these kinds of emergencies. But what happens when they're not necessarily controlled by or owned anymore by the public sector, right? So it really is sort of asking these very basic questions about who owns the city and who has rights to the city. These changes have some pretty profound implications for how we live in our cities and how we envision an urban future. But before we get to those big questions, we should probably start with some more fundamental questions. How did we get here? What was it that produced these changes? 
How and why did they take place in Chicago? And how do investors make money? How do they generate profits from these investments? Is there really so much money to be made off of these old pieces of infrastructure? And if so, why aren't our cities doing better? Why do they always seem to be broke? So there's really three sides to this and three sides to Chicago's emergence as a sell-off city. The first is the sell side, that is the push for the city to raise money to plug these budget gaps. The second is the buy side, the development of investor appetite for these deals. And the third is what we're calling statecraft, that is the emergence of a deal-making apparatus that positions urban infrastructure assets for private investment. Let's start with the sell side. This is one of the main reasons I think people understand why these infrastructure deals have have gone down, why cities have gravitated toward these long-term infrastructure leases. Basically, that cities really are broke, right? They are experiencing acute fiscal stress. Cities always seem to have uh, perennial budget deficits, and they are struggling. Cities like Chicago see themselves as competing with other places for quote unquote, positive business climate. And part of that positive business climate is having as low as possible of a tax burden, right? And this message has been reinforced by the Grover Norquists of the world, the ideologues, the anti-tax cheerleaders who are basically claiming that any tax is too much, that you raise taxes and you'll drive businesses and households away. And there have been taxpayer revolts, you know, starting in the 1970s with Prop 13 in California, homeowners rising up and demanding that states take action to try to control cities. So by placing things like tax expenditure limitations, what we commonly know as tax caps that restrict the ability of local governments to, to raise their taxes. And this especially affects non-home rule entities. So cities are restricted from raising money through the property taxes system or from implementing other kinds of taxes. And at the same time, they're required to do more with less. Since the 1970s, fiscal responsibility for providing urban infrastructure and urban services has been devolved from the federal government and then from the state government down to sort of the lowest actor in this fiscal food chain, which are cities, municipalities, local government agencies. And yet, even though they have more responsibility, funding from these higher entities, these higher scales of government have been cut, radically reduced. So local governments are forced to find other ways to compensate for the loss in federal and state funds. And they've done that by seeking out new sources of revenue particularly those that are not as obvious to taxpayers, things like fines and user fees. Especially bigger cities, they have pretty intense service needs, and those service needs have been growing for reasons related to these legacies of racial segregation, concentrated poverty. Big cities have to do more around things like affordable housing, neighborhood reinvestment, the provision of social services, And there are also legacy infrastructures in in cities, particularly older cities. They're dealing with roadways, streetscapes, bridges, public buildings that were built 100 years ago during the building boom of the, the 1920s. And many of them are crumbling and in pretty dire need of reinvestment. So cities are dealing with a lot of pressures to reduce costs and raise revenues in ways that are not necessarily obvious or evident. They've also been forced to make a lot of cuts. We talk about this in terms of austerity, firing public unionized workers oftentimes, and turning to the private sector to perform critical functions. So I think of this this move toward privatization as part and parcel of this fiscal stress that's facing cities. Another response to devolution and to fiscal stress uh, has been that cities gravitate to financial markets to raise revenue. They do it through, on the one hand, debt, and then on the other hand, through disposition, finding buyers and selling off existing assets. So let's start with debt and the increasing use of debt to manage revenue shortfalls. 
What do you do as a household when your bills are greater than your income? You charge them to your credit card. For cities, this has meant borrowing money by selling bonds. And this kind of debt-driven welfare is a critical way that Chicago avoids cutting operating expenses while not raising taxes. Now, in the past, municipal borrowing was often curtailed by state legislation. There were handcuffs, essentially, on what cities could do in terms of borrowing. But states have increasingly helped local governments that are caught in this kind of structural imbalance by giving them more political control to raise money by selling bonds or other forms of debt. They often dabble in high-cost, high-risk, variable rate debt. These are like the credit cards that have the highest interest rates. What this means is that more tax revenues are frequently channeled to interest payments rather than upgrading sidewalks or schools. So the taxes and fees that we pay to the city don't necessarily cover the services that we consume, but instead are dedicated to managing the city's debt service requirements from previous borrowing. It also means that cities are more beholden to credit rating agencies whose evaluations of the city's creditworthiness determine how much we have to pay for interest and to service our debt. The cities now borrow for even the most irregular expenses. The city of Chicago sells bonds to pay off legal settlements with families and individuals who are the victims of police violence. They pay very high interest rates. Uh, so perversely, we have investors who are profiting off the violence that is inflicted on people of color. The revenues going to interest payments are revenues that are not going to community development, education, uh, or restorative justice initiatives. So cities look to financial markets to solve a lot of their internal problems, this, you know, to sort of fill in for these structural budget deficits. Another way in which they try to enroll private investors or financial markets and sort of bring them into the picture is through, you know, what we were talking about earlier with this, with the disposition of public assets, right? Selling off the revenue streams from, from infrastructure to the highest bidder through these public-private partnerships. Cell phone towers and bus shelters, um, you know, basically cities looking at their own inventories of assets, public buildings, and trying to figure out how they can squeeze revenues out of them. And we even see you know, venture capital companies and tech firms taking over entire neighborhoods or parts of cities. I'm thinking here of a Google Sidewalks project in Toronto, which developed all these kinds of smart cities types of infrastructure sensors that were trying to monetize data flows, right? That was seen as a potential revenue source for these cash-strapped cities. On the buy side, we see that investors have new reasons to be interested in these kinds of infrastructures. If you look at the period of time when these P3 deals were becoming popular, we see that it coincided with a time when we have global investors flush with cash prospecting for new outlets, especially in the wake of stock market crashes and crises like those that occurred in the early 2000s. So investment firms saw cities and the built environment and public infrastructures as a way to sort of hedge inflation, look like a, a kind of safe haven, maybe not as subject to the volatility as things like the tech market or the stock market. So these large, well-capitalized investment banks went on the hunt and uh, were able to benefit from first mover advantages. They were some of the, the first on the dance floor, so to speak. So the, the amount of money, the sort of this giant pool of money looking for yields uh, found its way to these urban infrastructure deals. And we really see this kind of uh, generating a tremendous amount of interest, particularly in the, the first decade of the 2000s. This raises a pretty interesting question. How do investors make money off of urban infrastructure? When we look at that wave of deals in the 2000s in particular, we see some common elements. In many cases, the market for urban infrastructure assets during this period, it wasn't based on being a really good road operator. You weren't hoping to make a profit because you knew how to run a road. And we see in some of these generation of deals, some pretty novel approaches to generating profit 
out of infrastructure, especially infrastructure that had some pretty dubious financial track record to begin with. Investment banks essentially combining urban infrastructure assets into portfolios and selling shares in those portfolios to institutional investors, oftentimes earning transaction revenue by facilitating sales back and forth within the portfolio. And then urban infrastructure itself, turns out, was uh, uniquely positioned for the use of financial engineering, for derivatives and other kinds of advanced financial products that allowed the investors and these purchasers to speed up the profit rate, even in the early years of the deal. The infrastructure asset itself becomes a stepping stone to make more money in financial markets. So the use of complex derivatives essentially allowed investors to take marginal investments in some cases and turn them into highly profitable ventures. And that meant that uh, there's a, a bit of a, uh, a dual-edged sword here with the city earning very high payments from uh, its sales of these infrastructure assets, but at the same time, having those assets now uh, entangled in some highly speculative forms of financing. Yeah, a lot of risks involved in this sort of risky architecture. It's interesting, we, you know, we, we, we provide a lot of examples from Chicago, partly because we live here, we study the city, but there are other cities that have followed the, the same path, but not all cities have, right? There's a tremendous amount of variation in terms of which cities, which places have been able to undertake these kinds of deals. Not all cities have received the same amount of investor interest. Not all cities have received the same degree of fiscal stress that would lead them to these kinds of short-term solutions. And that brings us to sort of the, the third important factor in, in trying to understand this particular market, and that is what we were calling financial statecraft, the structures and practices of local government that al allows them to become active agents and sort of engineers of these kinds of deals. So in Chicago, we see a lot of the same consulting firms and law firms and bond underwriters who are doing all the deals that, that Phil just mentioned. And for each of the transactions, they're kind of repositioning themselves at different points in this network. Places like Chicago have been particularly successful in this regard because they've been able to build around them this kind of fixed structure of organized fiscal and political capacity that is able to withstand both changes in administration. So we've seen these same actors, no matter if it was Daly or Emanuel or Lightfoot, and the frequent restructuring of capital. Right? We had the global financial crisis, which caused uh, some of these financial actors to pull back, to reorganize and in different form. We see different kinds of instruments and different firms sort of taking their place, but we do see a consistency of interest and we see the development of this apparatus that has helped the thick structure of organized fiscal power Internally, from an administrative perspective, we also see certain changes in City Hall that have facilitated these deals. The city of Chicago, over the last couple of decades, has consolidated power in the mayor's office in the executive branch and selectively brought many frontline types of functions like parking and transportation into the executive, you know, from the different administrative agencies. We also see that the city has been successful at suppressing potential opposition to these kinds of deals. It has been able to suppress other claims to those revenues and other threats to the sale or the, the long-term lease of these assets like public sector unions. The use of interest rate swaps and uh, different kinds of exotic financial instruments in the Chicago public schools were able to proceed despite the opposition from the Chicago Teachers Union and using money basically to pay off organizations that might oppose the city's debt-heavy way of financing development. We see the city basically buying the complicity of affordable housing organizations and social service organizations by offering 
city funds. So you have to have a, a, a strong mayor, a sort of centralized administration to be able to enroll the potential opposition in order to move forward with many of these deals. It's taken a while, but there is now a lot more suspicion that these deals sort of raise the hackle, particularly after the parking meter deal. There was a lot more interest and concern and outrage about these privatization deals, and they haven't been as easy to steamroll and to kind of push through. There have been uh, groups that have been challenging the city's priorities and challenging the idea that the city is broke and, and is out of funds to help advance, whether it's racial justice or uh, the need to adapt the city for the challenges related to climate change. So I think that it took a while, but there are now constituencies and stakeholders and organizations that are very much watching the city's every move when it comes to deciding to, to sell off pieces of the public's pie, so to speak. So through this system, we see how revenues from urban infrastructure, how those are being sold off to private investors. The question is, what have been the effects of these changes? Results of Chicago's sell-offs can be seen as either good or bad or even ugly, depending on how you view the role of private finance in structuring how the city does business. So what could possibly be good about this? And in fact, there are many perspectives that suggest that this is actually kind of a good thing to do. Right? Think tanks, free market advocates, they have been promoting these deals on the basis of economic models of efficiency. The city doesn't necessarily have any real reason to be in the business of owning things. Transferring that to private actors to allow them to set prices according to the market, uh, those are often thought of as efficiency generating developments. Those provide infusions of needed cash. Those allow local governments, big cities like Chicago, to do things like renovate schools that have severe capital needs, or just to pay down their existing debt to increase their credit ratings so that they have a better margin of maneuver when they turn to municipal bond markets. We can see that in a number of areas within Chicago's history. So the money that the investors paid to lease the Green Line that allowed them to reinvest in fixing the tracks and improving the stations. Or when Morgan Stanley led a consortium to buy the 36,000 plus parking spaces in the city of Chicago, it agreed to update the fare boxes and implement uh, new metering technology, which would have been tens of millions of dollars that the city would have had to pay on its own. This allowed the city to raise prices, right, to raise the cost of parking to more accurately capture the value of being in different parts of the city, right, to raise downtown parking uh, fees but to do so in a way that didn't have political risks for the city. It wasn't the city that was raising the fares, it was the new private owners. It addresses some longstanding issues around political will to do the right thing. The city has been able to plug some of its budget holes uh, while water is leaking out elsewhere. You're right, Phil. These deals are really expensive to structure, and they often deliver dubious benefits to the city and its residents. There are high transaction costs involved in leasing off these infrastructures, paying the bond council and the lawyers and the consultants to do the deals. I think for the Green Line deal, there was about $9 million in transaction costs. The city pays about $100 million every year to banks and law firms and other businesses that help it to borrow money. So that apparatus is expensive to maintain. There are also costs to city residents, some of which are more obvious than others, right? I think we all saw those uh, skyway tolls go up and the parking rates to park downtown, they increased almost immediately when the lease to Morgan Stanley was signed. But we also see the impact of these concession deals in more indirect ways. The city is limited in what it can do with its assets after it's sold off the cash flows to these investment consortium. 
So for example, the city wants to host a street fair or put in a bike lane. It's now essentially taking the cash flow that it promised to Morgan Stanley. It forecloses different possibilities. City's Department of Transportation lifted its rush hour parking bans on over 200 city blocks to allow an extra four hours of meter eligible parking on busy city streets each day to basically satisfy the interests of investors, right? So it may not be a good thing for drivers trying to get out of the city during rush hour, but that was something the city felt it needed to do to assure a certain level of uh, revenue, of cash flows to the investors. Part of these deals often involve uh, what are called non-compete clauses, basically committing local governments to not build competing assets. So the city couldn't build additional public garages once it had sold off the revenue streams to investors. There's an opportunity cost to these deals. The city loses control over its assets for long periods of time, right? These concession leases are for 75 years, for 100 years, right? That's several generations of city residents who won't be able to benefit from certain kinds of foreclosed on policies and plans because of these deals. And that's not the worst of it, right? I mean, some of these deals have fallen apart. Right. So if we've got the good and the bad, then we have to pay attention to the ugly. Some of the examples that we've used the Skyway, the Green Line, these are risky deals. Now, these deals were sold on the idea that you're transferring the risk to the private sector, right? The city's getting out of the risky business of operating toll roads or subway lines or uh, other urban systems. But when you look more closely at the contracts, you find that that's not the case. And that during extraordinary events like default, cities, in fact, have placed themselves at the center of a kind of risky architecture of interlinked arrangements. One that over the course of 45 or 50, 75, or in some cases up to 99 years, structures ongoing conflicts with investors and with residents. What happens in the event of a default? So the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008 exposed these risks. Right? The Green Line shutdown had nothing to do with the viability of the Green Line as a piece of urban infrastructure, as a key part of our transportation system, instead had to do with some fairly remote issues around the credit rating of a kind of insurance giant. As the deals implode during these extraordinary moments, cities are forced into the situation of having to make controversial decisions about whether to take those assets back onto their books, whether to force losses onto uh, private contractors and how to distribute the costs and the pain among bondholders and banks and residents and taxpayers. Now, we may not see these in our day-to-day -day experience. It's really the limit cases where we see some of those, but they have come home to roost in Chicago public schools, for instance, closed 49 school buildings after its risky borrowing on the auction rate security markets after that crashed. And in limit cases like Detroit, we found that the cash flows themselves weren't sufficient to satisfy investors. The limit cases of delinquency and default and the fire sale of assets becomes a driving force within urban policy. What we've just discussed is pretty depressing. <laughs> it could get you pretty bummed out. And I would have said that I was despairing over the, the future of these kinds of infrastructure arrangements going into the future until just a couple of months ago, where I think we saw with the decision from the federal government and this certainly trillions of dollars in federal money being uh, slated for infrastructure, that that may be caused to, to rethink what we were talking about, or that might offer a little bit more optimism when we survey the current landscape. But, you know, how, how do you feel about the future, do you see any sort of any way out of the kinds of arrangements or conditions that we were just talking about? Is there any way to decolonize urban futures in terms of uh, decoupling city finances from financial markets? Well, I think the current moment is a really interesting one with the Biden administration's infrastructure proposals. And I think now that we've had 25 years of experience with some of these deals, 
they have a public profile that it's harder to justify for many of their advocates. The political alignments around pure public financing, right? Low cost interest rates using this historic moment as an opportunity to borrow on a massive scale for a kind of a generational infrastructure program that we haven't seen since the uh, Eisenhower years. That seems to be a, 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 a real moment. And that, and I think local opposition, cities were able to do these deals because they were doing them internally, right? City Hall was making these decisions about procurement and about financing and revenue. And those were highly technical conversations that at the outset were insulated from public oversight, public criticism. But now that we've lived through a few of those deals and they haven't been what we thought they were, now in places like Chicago, there's many more eyes on these kinds of deals and there's more legislative control. So if I'm going to try and think about the balance sheet of pros and cons, where are we at the current moment? I look to those, right? The sort of activism by the federal government and increasing advocacy and opposition at the urban scale as, as real potential alignments in favor of a, a different way of doing infrastructure than we've seen with the privatization wave of the last uh, two decades. I agree. I think the activism and advocacy at the local scale is going to be really important for preventing some of the negative features associated with, as you put it, the last wave of federal injection into you know major infrastructure systems during the Eisenhower administration, which basically were meant to facilitate the relocation of white households away from the city and to the suburbs. And I think, you know, one of the the main sort of infrastructural factors that contributed to the segregation within urban regions and across the country, the need to prioritize and center racial equity and concern about who's getting these dollars and what kinds of infrastructures are being invested in uh, is going to be so important at this point in time, there's going to be a real need for activist and progressive city council members, as well as the organizations that hold their feet to the fire. You know, I think we're going to need to pay a lot of attention to that to make sure that we don't just replicate some of the mistakes of the past. At the same time, the financial statecraft arrangements that we have been talking about, those haven't gone away. And in a lot of ways, those are still a durable solution set for cities that are trying to deal with fiscal strains and with new policy pressures and initiatives. So Chicago is another good example where, right, even as the market for big infrastructure deals fell apart after 2008, the apparatus of deal making just realigned itself and kind of moved on to new, new horizons, right? And we see some of these financial partnerships and deal making arrangements showing up in areas like climate change policy, the city still doesn't have the money to pay for those really critical kinds of expenditures. And lo and behold, if some of these creative financing and partnerships are proving themselves to be quite malleable as they're applied to new problematics, right? The smart city uh, is another area. You referenced uh, Google's project in Toronto. Those are the kinds of ways that right, even if we think that this is a good moment for reclaiming the city from finance, and doing infrastructure differently, I think we have to watch out for how these ways of managing city policy and the new generations of infrastructure, how those arrangements are structured and who benefits from them. Yeah. So maybe after listening to this podcast, you all will begin to see cities in terms of the cash flows that can be extracted from it. It's a very different way of viewing the material aspects of the built environment, but no less important than the other things that you think about as you're just trying to get from point A to point B. And I want to go back to a question we asked at the beginning. These changes have profound implications for how we live in our cities and how we envision an urban future. We've talked about how the city developed these ways of organizing infrastructure, but now we have to anticipate some of the long-term questions. Who am I paying? Who can I complain to if I'm not happy with the quality of these public services or infrastructure? And what happens in the case of emergency or health crisis when we expect the public sector and public things to help us out? Who owns our city at the end of the day? Doors closing.